This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for October 2nd through the 8th. On this week's show, one man almost single-handedly saves the music industry, two women do controversial things in back-to-back days, and we say happy birthday to a bunch of artists, including two Rock and Roll Hall of Fame members who were born five days apart. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. There are a lot of major births and deaths that happened this week in music history. So many that we can't actually completely go in depth with every single one of them. Otherwise, we'll be here for a few hours. However, what we're going to do is hit most with the highlights and a few of them we'll actually take a deep dive into. Let's get the sadness out of the way first and discuss the deaths. Tom Petty was born on October 20th, 1950 in Gainesville, Florida. Tom Petty's road to rock stardom was marked by an unwavering passion for music, as they always are, and his ability to craft songs that resonated deeply with his audiences. Petty's musical career took off in the early 1970s with the formation of his band Mud Crunch, which showcased his talent and laid the groundwork for his future success. However, it was with his band The Heartbreakers that Tom Petty truly found his voice and achieved all that widespread recognition that he got. The band's blend of rock, blues, and country music influences created his sound that captivated audiences throughout the world. His songwriting prowess was exceptional. His lyrics, often imbued with themes of love loss and the American working class, struck a chord with fans of all ages. With songs like American Girl, Don't Come Around Here No More, Breakdown, and Refugee, those all became anthems that defined his generation. Petty's ability to capture the essence of the everyday life made him a beloved figure in the music industry with all except for maybe a couple record labels, which we'll get to in a second. He also released a solo self-titled album that had the hits Free Fallin' and Running Down a Dream. Beyond his musical accomplishments, Petty was known for down-to-earth personality and his commitment to social issues. He was a huge advocate for various issues, including animal rights and environmental protection. He also fought his record company by filing for bankruptcy in order to keep them from trying to destroy his career. He ended up winning that battle and also helped out a whole lot of future musicians by doing so in the process. Tragically, Tom Petty passed away on October 2nd, 2017 from an accidental overdose of opioid medication a little over a year after Prince passed away from the same thing. Tom Petty was 66 years old. Loretta Lynn, a trailblazing figure in country music, left her legacy that continues to inspire generations of musicians and also fans. She was born Loretta Webb, and she was born in Butcher Holler, Kentucky in 1932. She went from rural poverty to international stardom, which was a testament to her talent and resilience. Loretta's early life was shaped by the hardships of the rural life. She married at a very young age, began raising a family while also trying to pursue her musical dreams. Her early performances are often in local honky-tonks and bars where she honed her skills, developed a unique style that blended traditional country with also elements of rock and roll. There's a theme going on here. In the early 1960s, Lynn's career took off with a series of hit songs that showcased her vocals and also her ability to tell authentic stories about the lives of working class women. Songs like Coal Miner's Daughter, Don't Come Home a Drinkin' Tonight, and I'm a Honky Tonk Girl became anthems for the women who faced the challenges and defied expectations of their time. 
Lynn's songwriting was often autobiographical and it drew inspiration from her own experiences and the lives of those around her. The lyrics were honest, relatable, and also had a touch of humor to go along with them. Loretta's ability to connect with her audience on a more personal level made her one of the biggest superstars in country music history. Throughout her career, Loretta was also a vocal advocate for women's rights and social justice. She addressed issues such as domestic violence, alcoholism, and the challenges that were faced by working class families. Loretta's music served as a voice for women who were often overlooked and or marginalized. Her impact on country music is immense. She paved the way for countless female artists and helped to define the genre. Her music continues to resonate with audiences throughout, and she passed away on October 4th, in 2022 at the age of 90. Janis Joplin, a powerful and influential singer in the rock music scene in the 1960s, left her mark on the world of music as well. She was born in Port Arthur, Texas in 1943, and her journey to stardom was marked by a rebellious spirit and a unique ability to connect with audiences on an even deeper, more emotional level, and also that incredible voice of hers. Janice's early years were characterized by a sense of isolation and a longing to be accepted. She found solace in music, immersing herself in blues and folk scenes in the 1960s. Her powerful vocals, especially her vocals, and her ability to convey raw emotion resonated with her audiences. Janice's breakthrough came with her involvement in the San Francisco psychedelic rock scene. As the lead singer of Big Brother and the Holding Company, she captivated audiences with her electrifying performances and her ability to channel her personal struggles into her music. Songs like Peace of My Heart and Ball and Chain became anthems for that generation that was trying to break free from societal constraints. Janice's solo career further solidified her status as a rock icon. Albums like Pearl and Cheap Thrills showcased her versatility as both a singer and a songwriter as she explored genres ranging from blues to rock to soul and to gospel. Her music was a reflection of her very complex personality, often revealing her vulnerability and her struggles with addiction. Despite her rise to fame, Janice's personal life was plagued by a lot of challenges. She had struggles with both addiction and depression, which ultimately led to her tragic death on October 4th, 1970, at the age of 27, joining the 27 Club, which no one wants to join. However, Janice's legacy lives on through her music. With her biggest hit, the Chris Christopherson co-written Me and Bobby McGee, being released posthumously on January 12, 1971. The legendary Eddie Van Halen was born in Amsterdam in 1955. Eddie's journey to stardom was marked by his extremely raw talent, even though he started out on the drums and Alex Van Halen, his brother, had started out on guitar, but then Alex decided that he wanted to play drums, so they switched instruments and changed rock music history in the process. Van Halen's musical career took off in the 1970s with the group Van Halen, conveniently named after them, a band that quickly rose to prominence with their energetic live performances and their groundbreaking sound, especially for that time. Eddie's guitar playing was characterized by lightning fast speed, his intricate tapping techniques, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out the song Eruption off their very first album. You'll understand. Also, he had a really good good way of seamlessly blending different musical styles all together. His iconic guitar solos, such as the one in Panama and also, of course, Eruption, became synonymous with the band's sound and earned him widespread acclaim. Beyond his technicality, 
Eddie was also a gifted songwriter. His compositions often incorporated elements of hard rock, blues, and classical music, creating a unique sound. Van Halen's songs, such as Jump and Dance the Night Away, became huge hits and solidified the band's status as one of the most influential rock acts of all time, as they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Van Halen's influence extended far beyond the realm of rock music. His guitar styles inspired other musicians and helped to redefine the boundaries of the instrument. His legacy as a guitar virtuoso and a pioneer of rock music will continue to be celebrated for generations to come. On my Mount Rushmore of guitarists, Eddie Van Halen is right up there with Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton. Eddie Van Halen passed away from throat cancer on October 6, 2020, at the age of 65. Ginger Baker, a legendary drummer and percussionist, also left his mark in rock music. Ginger was born in London in 1939, and his journey to stardom was marked by his extremely unconventional style, also his relentless energy and his ability to push the boundaries of drumming. Baker's musical career took off in the 1960s with his involvement in the group Cream, a groundbreaking super trio that revolutionized the world of rock music. Baker's drumming was characterized by powerful and explosive style, his complex rhythms, and his ability to seamlessly integrate different musical genres. His iconic drum solos, such as those in Toad and Sunshine of Your Love, became synonymous with the band's sound and earned him widespread acclaim. One time, he even collapsed on stage after doing an over-20-minute drum solo. Beyond his technical prowess, Ginger was also known for his wild and extremely unpredictable personality, his rebellious spirit, and also his way of courting controversy often made headlines, but his talent cannot be denied. Ginger's drumming was a driving force behind Cream's success, and his influence on generations of drummers is still being felt today. After the breakup of Cream, Baker continued to pursue his career working with a variety of artists and exploring different musical genres. His collaborations with Fela Kuti and the Africa 70 band introduced him to a new musical horizon and further expanded his artistic range. He also had a reputation for being, well, to be nice about it, not a nice guy guy, including the time he pulled a knife on fellow Cream bandmate Jack Bruce. However, with that being said, his legacy as a drummer and a pioneer of rock music cannot be denied. Ginger Baker passed away on October 6, 2019, at the age of 80. Now to someone who gets credit for a lot of things, but his contributions to the music industry often get overlooked. Without him, though, the music industry would definitely be a whole lot different. There are many who know the myth of Steve Jobs. To some, he's the man who helped to create the Mac and the cult of Mac with himself as patron saint and god. The John Lennon to Bill Gates's Paul McCartney, you might say. The cool kid with the overpriced toys. To others, he was a tyrant. The guy who was a perfectionist to the extreme. If you didn't live up to his overreaching expectations, then you were berated in front of your peers, as portrayed in that hatchet job of a movie called Steve Jobs starring Michael Fassbender. To me... He was probably, like most people, including myself, somewhere between being a saint and a sinner. In short, he was human, but he was a human with a whole lot of vision. What most people under the age of 30 either don't remember or realize, especially musicians and music lovers, is that Steve, along with changing their lives with the iPad, also changed it with three other things, two of which get talked about all the time and one that kind of gets lost in the fray a lot, mainly because it gets taken for granted. 
See, back in the days before the internet became the internet, you had to, of course, go to the record store to get your overpriced records, cassettes, and CDs. If your favorite song off of someone's album didn't get released as a single, well, tough luck. You had to go and buy the entire album, which really did not feel good. Record stores and labels were making tons of money, while recording artists were being screwed out of their money which, of course, still happens to this day. There weren't many other revenue streams, though, for artists out there at that time, unlike what you can do today as an artist. And then 1999 hit. Okay, specifically Sean Parker and Napster. Suddenly, you could download your singles. You didn't have to go to a record store anymore. Plus, you could get them for free. Free 99, as I like to say. No more spending $3 on a single or almost 20 bucks on an album. The quality of the recordings varied, though, with some being labeled one song and actually being a completely different song, and then sometimes you had songs that were actually malware. Naturally, though, the recording industry was not having it. They started seeing their revenue crater, so what were they going to do? Well, they were going to attack their fans, of course. They started suing people left and right who downloaded off of Napster and all of those copycat sites like Kazaa. And that began to backfire massively. Because not only did they get people pissed off at them, but those people still defiantly continued to download free music. Then... Record labels started flooding the sites with their own versions of the songs with either looped versions of parts of the songs or bad quality versions of their own that would make people delete the songs and not use the file sharing sites. Think of it as the music industry's version of poisoning the water supply. It was at this point, though, that seeing an opportunity, Steve Jobs stepped in and almost single-handedly saved the music industry. Okay, mainly from itself, really. In 2001, he helped to come up with a device that helped music lovers everywhere. The iPod. No longer did you need to carry around a bunch of tapes or CDs. I myself used to have a few briefcases full of cassette tapes. Ask your parents or your grandparents. They'll know what we're talking about. However, you still needed a safe place to download the music. Well, at a price, of course. Enter the program that, to this day, Steve Jobs does not get a whole lot of credit for. iTunes started out as Sound Jam MP back in 1998 and released in 1999. Apple bought the company that created it in 2000, then changed the program and re-engineered it to fit their new iPods in 2003. There was still a major part that was missing, though, the shopping aspect. Legend has it that Steve Jobs summoned all the heads of the record labels together, and then he laid down the law. He first told them that they were screwing up by suing their own customers. I mean, what corporation does that? Then he told them about his idea called the iTunes Store. For a split of the cost, of course, iTunes would sell clean copies of their music. Jobs did not take no for an answer, despite the fact that the labels argued against it because, of course, the labels wanted to not give Apple much of a cut for their profits, if any. In fact, they tried everything to not give any sort of profits for doing it. For the record, by the way, labels and musicians have a long and storied history of protesting new technologies such as the LP record, blank cassettes and CDs, and the VHS player, etc., etc. So why would MP3s be any different? The labels, though, eventually did agree to Jobs' plan. And in 2003, the iTunes Store was released, which helped to pull the recording industry back from the brink. It had a profound effect on the industry. It hastened the end of record stores as we knew them. Most big record store chains, if they wanted to survive, diversified and started selling video games and geek toys. 
album sales also dropped as people started buying more individual singles, and that meant that artists could no longer rely on album royalties in order to make money, so they had to tour more, which meant that ticket sales went up. Way up. Jobs followed up the iPod and iTunes with the iPhone in 2007, which of course combined an iPod with a phone and a computer, which took artist revenue streams to a whole other level because now you can make money off of apps, ringtones, etc., etc. Now, why in the world are we talking about Steve Jobs with as much as he did for the music industry? Well, because sadly, on October 5th, 2011, Steve Jobs passed away from pancreatic cancer. People forget that along with all of the things that Steve did with Apple and also buying a little company from George Lucas of Star Wars fame and helping to turn that company into Pixar. Yes, kids, before it was sold to Disney, it was actually Steve Jobs' company. Steve helped out the music industry immensely. The iPod, the iTunes Store, and the iPhone. Three things that helped to save the music industry. And all brought to you by the man, the myth, the legend, Steve Jobs. The man who today, by most standards, people would still agree, is the best second act in business history, Google him if you don't know what I'm referring to. Steve Jobs passed away from pancreatic cancer on October 5th, 2011, at the age of 56. This next man does not get enough love these days, especially with everything that he accomplished. So we are going to give him the extended treatment as well. His distant relatives, first cousins twice removed, include actors Dennis and Randy Quaid. He is the man they nicknamed the Singing Cowboy. He is Gene Autry. Gene Autry was born on September 29, 1907 in Tioga, Texas. His parents moved to Oklahoma when he was a teenager. As a child, he worked on his parents' ranch until he graduated high school. At the age of 17, Gene struck out on his own, becoming a telegraph operator in Chelsea, Oklahoma. His singing career started in 1928 because of someone famous. During his downtime while he was working, Gene pulled out a guitar and sang, a practice that later got him fired from that job. Before he got fired, though, a customer who was passing through town heard him and encouraged him to sing professionally. That customer was humorist extraordinaire Mr. Will Rogers. As soon as he could afford to, Gene moved to New York City to try his luck with show business. Although he was turned down for a recording contract at the time with RCA Records, he did head back to Oklahoma with some advice to start his career by doing local radio shows. Gene started singing on radio shows in Oklahoma, which got him a recording contract with Columbia Records in 1929. By 1930, Gene was going back and forth between Chicago and New York City, recording hillbilly-style records, and he got his first big break in 1932 with the song That Silver-Haired Daddy of Mine. He also partnered up with another singer in Chicago, Smiley Burnett. And together, they made a bunch of records. In fact, it was because of their act that Autry ended up with the movies when the duo were discovered by film producer Nat Levine. Gene really made a name for himself when he did 44 Westerns, starting in 1934. Gene was in the Air Force in World War II, where he became a C-109 transport pilot. He also had a radio show called Gene Autry's Melody Ranch, which also ran on CBS radio during the war from 1940 all the way up past the war to 1956. During this show, since Gene had a bunch of kids that looked up to him, he came up with what was called the Cowboy Code. Think of these rules as the Ten Commandments if you want to be a cowboy. In fact, people also called them the Cowboy Commandments. And after you hear the rules, you'll probably think to yourself, man, Gene Autry was woke. I'm just kidding about the woke part. The rules were, one, 
The cowboy must never shoot first, hit a smaller man, or take unfair advantage. Two, he must never go back on his word or a trust confided in him. Three, he must always tell the truth. Four, he must be gentle with children, the elderly, and animals. Well, that leaves for RFK Jr. out. Anywho, five, he must not advocate or possess racially or religiously intolerant ideas. Oh, that just killed half the presidential candidates and VPs. Anywho, six, he must help people in distress. Seven, he must be a good worker. Eight, he must keep himself clean in thought, speech, action, and personal habits. Nine, he must respect women, parents, and his nation's laws. And that wiped out half of the politicians in America right there. And 10, the cowboy is a patriot, which wiped out pretty much the rest of them. Anyway, Gene's music and movie career went hand in hand. As he became more popular in the movies, his record sales started to rise. As far as his music career went, he sang some of the biggest standards in American music history, including his signature song, Back in the Saddle Again, along with Don't Fence Me In, Tumbling Tumbleweeds, and Ghost Riders in the Sky. He also sang some of the biggest holiday classics ever, including Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Here Comes Santa Claus, Frosty the Snowman, and Peter Cottontail. In total, he did almost 100 movies and well in excess of over 600 songs. Gene was also an entrepreneur. Gene became a ranch owner, buying the Monogram Ranch in 1953 and renaming it the Melody Ranch. Gene became a partner in a company called the World Championship Rodeo Company, which supplied all of the livestock for rodeos. He had endorsement deals with comic strips, producing Gene Autry comics in the 1950s. In the late 1960s, he bought the film rights to a lot of his old films from Republic Pictures and made money off of them during the VHS boom in the 1980s. He had a deal with Kenton Hardware Company to make toy guns. Gene also owned the baseball team, the Anaheim slash Los Angeles Angels, several television and radio stations, a small hotel chain, and had a town named after him in Oklahoma. Gene Autry passed away from lymphoma on October 2nd, 1998. And when you look at guys these days like Ryan Reynolds and Dwayne Johnson owning a bunch of different businesses, they probably learned how by studying the OG entertainer businessman model that Gene Autry started almost 80 years earlier. Because, as it turned out, Gene was the template. Gene Autry, passing away from lymphoma on October 2nd, 1998. This last one is strictly for Gen X Me, mainly because he sang one of my favorite songs. Actually, a couple of them. Benjamin Orr, the bassist and vocalist for the Cars, was a pivotal figure in the new wave and power pop scene of the 1970s and 1980s. Born in Lakewood, Ohio in 1947, Benjamin's music career took off in the early 1970s with the formation of the group The Cars, a band that quickly rose to prominence with their innovative sound and their stylish image. Orz's bass playing was characterized by his melodic style and his ability to complement the guitar work of Rick Ocasek, who was also the lead singer. Benjamin's vocals, however, were his true calling card. Benjamin's soulful and expressive voice added a human touch to the band's often synth-driven sound, and Benjamin's songs, such as Just What I Needed and Drive, became anthems for a generation. Drive is one of my all-time favorite songs, by the way. Orr then left the cars and put out a solo album, which had another one of my favorite songs, Stay the Night. Despite his success with the cars, Benjamin struggled with personal demons throughout his life, including bouts of alcoholism and depression. Unfortunately, Benjamin Orr passed away from cancer on October 3rd, 2000. Benjamin Orr, bassist of the cars, 
was 53 years old. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. And if you thought that by some of my comments during the whole Cowboy Commandments thing that maybe I'm a little too frustrated with the presidential election season and would just like the election to get here and be done already, you would be 100% correct. Holy moly, things are getting ridiculous. Anyway, that's enough of the politics. Let's move on. There were some other events worth mentioning this week that happened in music history that have nothing to do with passings or actually birthdays. For instance, on October 7, 1982, the musical Cats opened up on Broadway, breaking records and getting nominated for 11 Tony Awards, winning seven of them. On October 8, 1990, a day after seeing Soundgarden performed in California, singer Eddie Vedder went to Seattle, Washington to meet his new bandmates for the first time. The band, of course, was Pearl Jam, at that time known as Mookie Blaylock after the basketball player. The band would then spend the next week recording what would become their debut album, Ten, and of course, history kind of took over from there. Spotify, a Swedish audio streaming platform, has had a huge impact on the way people consume music, of course. Founded in 2006 by Daniel Ek and Martin Lauritsen, Spotify launched its service in Sweden on October 7, 2008, starting out by offering songs and albums before including podcasts like this one, which you can find on Spotify, to consumers for a freemium model, as they say, freemium the freemium model, which allows users to access a limited amount of content for free with ads or to subscribe to a premium service for ad-free listening and additional features, proved to be a pretty successful strategy. Spotify's user-friendly interface, extensive music catalog, and personalized recommendations quickly attracted a large following. As Spotify's popularity grew, it of course faced challengers from competitors like Apple Music and Pandora. However, Spotify's early mover advantage and its focus on innovation allowed it to maintain its position as the market leader. The company continued to expand its offering, including features like family plans and personalized playlists. Spotify's impact on the music industry has, of course, been extremely significant. The platform has empowered artists to reach a wider audience and made it easier for listeners to discover new music. However, it has also raised concerns about the fair compensation of artists and the impact of streaming on the music industry's business model, along with concerns about third-party companies getting involved with people who promote the popular Spotify playlists. And while it's great to have all that music at your fingertips, it's also kind of a way to make sure that you only listen to certain types of music, which means that it's not extended past your normal major record labels. Hopefully you throw in a few of the minor labels music as well. Just saying, helps keep you more rounded. In any event, the launch of Spotify in Sweden happened on October 7th, 2008. Paisley Park Studios, located in Chanhassen, Minnesota, just outside of Minneapolis, is a legendary recording studio and performance venue, which was, of course, owned and operated by the legendary Prince, the Icon. Built in the early 1980s, Paisley Park was Prince's home base where he could experiment with music art and technology. 
The studio's unique design was a reflection of the way Prince thought, which was to be nice, very eclectic. The main recording room was a large open space with soaring ceilings and floor-to-ceiling windows that offered stunning views of the surrounding countryside. The studio was also equipped with state-of-the-art recording equipment, allowing Prince to push the boundaries of music productions whenever he wanted to, even if it was at three in the morning after he woke up from something. Paisley Park was also a performance venue where he hosted small concerts and private parties. Prince often used the studio to experiment with new ideas and to collaborate with other musicians. The studio's unique atmosphere and its association with Prince made it a pilgrimage for musicians from around the world like Madonna, R.E.M., and Lizzo to record in the studios. After Prince's death in 2016, Paisley Park was transformed into a museum dedicated to his life and work. The museum features exhibits showcasing the icon's music, his fashion, and his personal belongings. Visitors can tour the studio and see his recording equipment and experience all that creative energy that once filled the place. Paisley Park opened to visitors on October 6, 2016. Now, let us turn our attention to two women, two events, one day apart, both with a lot of controversy. First off, in the early 1990s, Madonna was on a roll. She had already established herself as the queen of controversy with her music videos, wardrobe, and statements to the press. She had fought the Roman Catholic Church and conservatives, and now she was going to up the ante a whole lot more. Madonna decided to put out an album called Erotica, along with a book of risque photography called The Sex Book. In order to promote them, she decided to do a music video for the first single, Erotica. The video had her playing a dominatrix, while clips of her shooting photos for the sex book were spliced into the footage. That footage including her sitting topless on an older guy's lap, shooting photos with rapper Big Daddy Kane, model Naomi Campbell, and actress Isabella Rossellini in controversial poses, among other things. It was kind of a fine art book long before fine art nude photography kind of took over. MTV first aired the music video on October 2nd, 1992 at 10 o'clock at night. They would air it only two more times before permanently banning the video. Her record label, Sire slash Warner Brothers, later sold the uncensored video as a video single. I still actually have my copy of my collection. Can't lie. No shame. Madonna didn't actually have a problem with MTV banning the video. She got what she wanted. It caused publicity for the album and for the sex book, which both went on sale a few weeks later. Besides, as we all know by now, even bad publicity is better than no publicity. Madonna, however, would come to regret that last statement just a little by sticking her nose into the controversy around the event that happened the very next night after MTV first aired Erotica. October 3rd, 1992's Saturday Night Live musical performance was supposed to be routine. Sinead O'Connor was riding high off of her second album and was on the show to sing Bob Marley's War. During the dress rehearsal taping, she held up a photo of a refugee child. Producer Lorne Michaels said, eh, he was okay with that, no problem. On the live show, though, Sinead performed War, but right when she sang the word evil, she held up a photo of not the refugee child, but of then-Pope John Paul II. She then ripped up the photo and threw it at the camera. The audience didn't know what to do. The control room didn't know what to do. The shot just went silent to a commercial. Very few people applauded. The show's switchboard lit up with angry phone calls. O'Connor took a lot of heat for what she did. The next week's host, Joe Pesci, held the taped up photo of the Pope and said that if he were the host of the show that night when she did it, he would have given her a smack. That statement got long and loud applause, by the way, because, yeah, hitting a woman, 
Always a good idea. The idiot. Anyway, what people didn't realize, or at least didn't want to admit at the time, was that Sinead was protesting the church's record of child abuse. At that point, it was treated more as rumors and lies than actual fact. Shania was about a decade ahead of her time as rumors and lies became fact and criminal cases when the church pedophilia scandal started blowing up worldwide. Asked to this day if she would have done anything differently since she took a whole lot of flack for doing it, Shania had said that she would have done it all over again. Oh, Back to Madonna, who decided, I guess, that Sinead was stealing a little bit too much publicity away from the erotica album and the sex book. So, of course, she chimed in, surprisingly against Sinead, saying that Sinead should have done something differently and spoken about child abuse elsewhere. Much of the music press took Sinead's side on that bit of controversy, calling Madonna hypocritical. Sometimes, Shutting your mouth is actually better than bad publicity or no publicity. Two ladies, two events, two days. 1992, Madonna's erotica music video on MTV on October 2nd. Sinead O'Connor's appearance that was highly controversial on Saturday Night Live on October 3rd. We have a bunch of birthdays to get to this week, including two members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame who were born exactly five days apart. This first artist was born on October 3rd, 1969. She styled herself after Debbie Harry of Blondie, who she saw as combining power and sex appeal. She has three other siblings, including a brother who was a member of her band until he quit to do animations for the Simpsons television show. The band's first couple of albums flopped due to their sound being different from the grunge wave that was engulfing the world at that time. However, their third album broke through and became a huge hit. She stayed with their band for almost 18 years while also having a successful solo career. These days, she's also known for having a fashion line being the occasional guest judge spot on The Voice. She is the ex-wife of Gavin Rossdale of Bush, the now wife of country music superstar Blake Shelton, the ex-lead singer and now back together again band, no doubt, Miss Gwen Stefani, born October 3rd, 1969. This young buck was born Peter Jean Hernandez on October 8th, 1985 in Honolulu, Hawaii. After being dropped very stupidly by Motown Records, he signed with Atlantic Records in 2009. His first two hits were actually as part of a production team called the Smeezingtons. That team helped to produce Nothing On You by the B.O.B. and Billionaire by Travi McCoy, both very popular songs. He actually sang the hook on both of those songs. And it was from there that he had his own solo success, and he's been pretty much nonstop ever since. He already has 15 Grammy Award wins, including three for Record of the Year, with much more coming, I'm sure. And he's also been a part of two Super Bowl halftime shows. Now he's collaborating with Anderson Pock as the duo Silk Sonic, who have won a few Grammy Awards of their own. Mr. 24 Karat Magic himself, Mr. Bruno Mars, born on October 8th, 1985. The legendary Stevie Ray Vaughan, who was a virtuoso guitarist and singer, was born in Dallas, Texas on October 3rd, 1954. His musical career took off when he formed the group Double Trouble, a band that quickly gained a reputation for their energetic live performances and powerful sound, and especially his guitar playing, which was categorized by lightning fast speed, expressive tones, and his abilities to just blend all those styles seamlessly together. He also had iconic guitar solos, such as those in Texas Flood, Pride and Joy, and also his remake of Stevie Wonder's classic Superstition. Beyond his technical prowess, 
Vaughn was a gifted singer and songwriter. He was deeply rooted in the blues tradition, but he incorporated elements of rock, soul, and funk in order to create his own sound. His songs such as Crossfire and his version of Jimi Hendrix's song Little Wing became anthems for blues enthusiasts, especially in the late 80s and into the early 90s. Plus, he also played the guitar solo on the iconic David Bowie song, Let's Dance. Stevie Ray Vaughan was quickly gaining a huge reputation and success in the late 1980s with his innovative guitar playing and also his songs. But just when he was about to break through, he had an untimely death in a helicopter accident in 1990 at the age of 35. However, his legacy still lives on, and he and Double Trouble are now members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Happy birthday to the legendary Mr. Stevie Ray Vaughan, born October 3rd, 1954. Brian Johnson, the lead singer of ACDC, is a legendary figure in the world of rock music. He was born on October 5th, 1947 in Sunderland, England. His journey to rock and roll stardom actually started over in England before he joined ACDC in 1980 after the death of the original lead singer for ACDC, Bon Scott. His arrival marked a new era for the ACDC band and helped to cement ACDC's status as one of the most influential rock acts of all time, with songs like Back in Black, You Shook Me All Night Long, Big Guns, For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, and Who Made Who. Brian Johnson, lead singer of ACDC, born on October 5th, 1947. Bob Geldof, a musician, activist, and philanthropist, has also made a huge impact on the world through mainly his humanitarian efforts, a little bit through his music. He was born in Dublin, Ireland on October 5th, 1951. His music career started when he joined the Boomtown Rats, who had, of course, their big hit, I Don't Like Mondays. However, it was Geldof's involvement in the Live Aid concerts in 1985 that catapulted him to international fame and solidified his reputation as a humanitarian. The Live Aid concerts were a monumental effort to raise funds for famine relief in Ethiopia. Geldof, along with fellow musician Midge Ure of the group Status Quo, organized the event, which featured performances by some of the biggest names in music at that point. The concerts were a resounding success, raising millions of dollars and drawing attention to the plight of millions of starving people. Geldof's involvement in Live Aid marked the beginning of a lifelong commitment to humanitarian causes. He founded the Band Aid Trust, a charity organization dedicated to raising funds for famine relief in Africa. He has also been a vocal advocate for various other social issues, including debt relief, climate change, and human rights. Sir Bob Geldof, born October 5th, 1951. Now to those two Hall of Famers who were born exactly five days apart. We will start with the older of the two first. The Police were one of the biggest bands to come out of the post-punk era in England. Their mixture of pop, punk, and reggae, along with thoughtful lyrics, gave them five multi-platinum albums and scores of hits. Gordon Sumner was a former school teacher who was in the jazz fusion band Last Exit when he met drummer Stuart Copeland up in Newcastle, England. The two guys hit it off, and when Sting, which was Gordon's nickname, moved to London, he and Stuart got together and started jamming. And soon they formed the band The Police. The guys got Henry Padovani, who was the guitarist for the group The Corsicans, to be their guitarist. While the guys were getting the police going, Sting was also in a group called Strontium 90. Stewart would sit in sometimes and play drums. It was there that the guys met guitarist Andy Summers. Impressed by his playing, they asked him to be the police's second guitarist. He said yes, but he really wanted to be the only guitarist. Sting and Stewart weren't really thrilled with kicking Henry out of the band, but after a couple of gigs as a quartet, 
Eh, They kind of had to let Henry go, unfortunately. The group, now a trio, released their debut album, Outlandus D'Amour, in 1978. The album yielded the hits Roxanne, Can't Stand Losing You, and So Lonely. The first two hits were sort of banned by the BBC, which is to say that they couldn't be played at certain times. No matter, the songs were big hits because how much more street cred could a new band possibly get than being banned by the BBC? Their next album, 1979's Regatta de Blanc, had the hits Walking on the Moon and Message in a Bottle. While the album hit number one in Great Britain, they were hard-pressed to find much success in America. Outlandis only got to number 25 on the Billboard Albums chart, while Regatta didn't even crack the top 40. The band finally broke through in America with the 1980 album Zenyatta Mandata. That album had the top 10 American singles, The Do 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 Da 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 and Don't Stand So Close to Me. What helped the album at this point was MTV, which had just come on the scene by that point. The police's music videos gave them the exposure they needed to crack the American market. Their next album, Ghost in the Machine, furthered their ambitions with the hit songs Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic and Spirits in the Material World. The police really hit their peak with their next album, which turned out to be their final album, Synchronicity. The lead single from that album was written by Sting, and it is one of the most misunderstood songs in rock music history. Not for its words, but for its subject matter. The song is actually about a stalker, but people everywhere think to this day that it's a love song. Sting still says that people come up to him and say that their babies were conceived to this song, which kind of makes him cringe. Sting wrote the song actually in 1982 while he was staying at James Bond author Ian Fleming's Goldeneye estate in Jamaica. Sting was going through a divorce at the time, but says that he was also thinking about government and media surveillance. He only realized after the fact just how creepy the song sounded, even though it sounded like a love song. Sarah McLaughlin actually had the same problem with her song Possession, which is actually about a man who stalked her before he took his own life, but it also sounded like a love song. The music video also helped this song achieve its popularity. Directed by Godly and Cream, the video is a black and white video that uses a lot of shadow effects and imagery. The music video turned out to be one of the most recognizable music videos ever to be made and won a lot of awards. The song had further life when Sean Combs, now he's kind of famous for all the wrong reasons, heavily sampled the song for his tribute song to the Notorious B.I.G., I'll Be Missing You. Sting even graciously sang the song with Sean during a Grammy ceremony. No, Sting was never at any of those parties. Just saying that right off the bat. What Sting was not so gracious about, and rightfully so, was the fact that Sean Combs sampled Sting's song without Sting's permission. In other words, much like a lot of his other stuff, Sean basically stole the song. Combs had to give up royalties on the song, which last figure I saw meant that Sting makes $2,000 every day on average just from Combs' version, let alone the police's original song. For those of you trying to do the quick math in your head on that, that means, or should I say meant, that Sting made $730,000 a year in royalties from Combs' version of the song, just because Combs didn't first ask to use that song. So there's a lesson in there for you budding DJs and artists. Don't steal someone else's song. Do the professional courtesy thing and ask first. However, now that Sean's in just a little bit of trouble, my thought is is that his version of the song isn't going to get played as much, which means that Sting is going to lose out on a major cash cow just because of this guy's alleged, well, issues. Enough on that. The police broke up after their tour for synchronicity due to infighting, but they are still considered one of the greatest bands of the 1980s, and they've already been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. After that, Sting had, and still does have, a very successful solo career. 
His solo work started with Dream of the Blue Turtles, then Nothing Like the Sun, and The Soul Cages, Ten Summoners, Tales, Mercury Falling, and Brand New Day, all of which went top 10. There were also hit songs like If You Love Somebody, Set Them Free, Fortress Around Your Heart, We'll Be Together, Englishman in New York, All This Time, If I Ever Lose My Faith in You, Fields of Gold, Desert Rose, along with his hit All for Love with Brian Adams and Rod Stewart. Together, as a solo act and a member of the police, he has sold 350 million records worldwide. Happy birthday to Mr. Gordon Sumner, a.k.a. Sting, born October 2nd, 1951. Next to Sting's slightly younger birthday compadre, before he was one of the founders of Farm Aid, before he was an inductee of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame himself, before he was a staple on classic rock stations everywhere. He was just a guy with a made-up stage name who was trying not to get booted off of his own record label. John Mellencamp was a relatively struggling rock and roller named Johnny Cougar back in the early 1980s. His first album yielded a minor hit. His record company hated his next album so much that not only did they not release the album, but they dropped him from the label. They ended up releasing the album once he became popular, though, in order to cash in on his newfound fame because, yeah, that's what sleazebags do. Under his new record label and under his new stage name, John Cougar, he released another album that had a couple of top 40 hits. The record label was pleased because, as John put it, the label thought that he was another Neil Diamond, which, okay, that's weird. He started working on his next album called American Fool, which, according to John, was three good songs and the rest of it was filler. The record company reps came to the studio to hear his new songs, including the good ones, and hated all of them. Their thought pattern went from getting a new producer to dropping Mellencamp from the label completely. Finally, cooler heads prevailed and he was allowed to finish that album. One of his good songs, as he called it, was a mid-tempo rocker. The idea came to him when he thought about something a friend of his said about a visit to a chiropractor. He said it hurt so good. Mellencamp used the line, traded off lyrics with his writing partner at the time, and worked out the chords within a day. When the song was released, it became a huge hit. It spent 16 weeks in the top 10 and got as high as number 2. Probably would have gone for number 1 if not for Survivor's mega smash, Eye of the Tiger, being in the way at that time. The song also got John a Grammy Award the next year. The album that it came from, American Fool, hit number one. That song, Hurt So Good, came right before his follow-up, which also became a huge hit, Jack and Diane, which was also off of that album. After that, Mellencamp had great albums like Scarecrow and also classic songs like Pink Houses, The Authority Song, Cherry Bomb, and a ton more, which led to his induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Not bad for a guy that was this close to being thrown off of his record label. Happy birthday to John Mellencamp, born October 7th, 1951. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for October 2nd through the 8th. Thank you for listening and for watching if you're watching on Spotify or YouTube. 